Like a juicy burger with a hair in it, there are some watches that are just so, so close to being perfect, but they just don't quite make it. Here's a whole bunch of them, and what I'd do to fix them. The last one's a sneaky little rascal. The Omega Seamaster is available in around 9 million different flavours, and that presents a harder choice than asking Charlotte what she'd like to do this evening. Do you go murky green, summer blue, gold and titanium? The choice is as endless as a prog rock A-side. Well, let me help you out a bit here, because not only can I show you what I think is the best looking Seamaster that you didn't know about, but I can also save you a little bit of money too. This is the Omega Seamaster Diver 300M Beijing 2022, a special edition for, well, I'm sure you can figure that one out for yourself. Before I tell you about the watch, let me tell you about the price. £5,280, £220 cheaper than a standard Seamaster on a bracelet. So what makes it so good? It's otherwise identical to the standard Seamaster, except in a few key details that I think elevate it above all the others. 1. The dial. The standard is flat blue, but this has a pop-in sunburst that, to me, looks better than the summer blues. Then there's the bezel. Although the watch is still in 42mm of finest stainless disc steel, the bezel is titanium, with raised markers and a mottled backdrop. The ceramic bezel on the standard version has markers whiter than me after a long winter, which I can tell you is not a good look. Even the summer blue, which tries to rectify that situation with baby blue markers, feels a bit off. This is the yacht master of the Seamaster lineup, if that makes sense, the one that pulls off splashy lux the best. But the theme here is that it's almost perfect, but not quite. So what's my beef with this watch? Surprisingly, it's not the case back, a very solid celebration of the 2022 Olympics and likely the reason why the watch is a little cheaper. It's the dial. Instead of making a very nice watch look, well, very nice, Omega insisted on squeezing the Olympic colours in there too. So instead of being the perfect Seamaster, it looks a bit like an Xbox controller instead. Just as we all got used to the idea of Seiko making fancy watches called Grand Seiko, they're back at it again with the naming conventions. This time it's with legacy brand King Seiko, which confusingly sounds one better than Grand Seiko. It's not though. I'll try and unravel this one before we go any further. So back in the 60s, the Swiss used to have this fun game called Let's See Who Can Make The Best Watch, where they competed to make a movement so accurate it would be more accurate than all the other accurate movements. Seiko, presumably sat at the sidelines wearing one of those little hats with a propeller on it, decided it wanted to play too. The big kids in Switzerland laughed little Japanese Seiko out the door, and so this is where our hero dug deep to come up with a competition all of its own. Instead of making one good watch, it would make two and compete them against each other. One was called Grand Seiko, the other King Seiko. After each round of competition, the winner would share its secrets with the loser and go again. Eventually, the outcome was a watch that could take on the Swiss, and take them on it did. There was no ignoring the fact that little Japanese Seiko whooped Swiss butt, and that's why it's now big Japanese Seiko. The other reason is that Quartz removed the need for high accuracy mechanical movements entirely. Again, it was Seiko that delivered the killer blow, although the Swiss had already been entering Quartz movements into the competitions, like the sneaky little cheats that they are. With the rise of luxury watches, Grand Seiko re-emerged into the world in 2010, and in 2022 King Seiko followed, priced a little more than your average Seiko, and a lot less than your average Grand Seiko. And it is a thoroughly good looking watch, but the fly in the ice cream here is that it's fitted with either a 6R or 6L movement, depending on size. For a watch built on the legacy of an accuracy demon, having a minus 10 plus 15 seconds per day deviation at best, and minus 15 plus 25 seconds per day at worst, seems a bit like fitting a Spitfire with a larder engine. The 4S used in a previous King Seiko revival would be much better suited. Oh hello, I didn't see you there. I was too busy enjoying all this fantastic new channel merch, and you can too. So if you want to be as cool as me, or perhaps even cooler, check it out just below the video. Thanks very much. They did things different back in the day. The guy who made Breitling watches was called Breitling, so the watches were called Breitling too. The best watches in the Breitling range were called Premier because, well, they were. 
Since then, things have got confusing. People wanted watches, then they didn't want watches, and then they did again, but different. And Breitling, like an old man trying to download the internet, struggled to keep up. They needed young blood, and they got it in the form of creative director Sylvain Berneron, who sat down with the CEO one day and convinced him he was nuts. I say nuts, I mean pistachios, because the Premier B09 Chronograph is not only one of the best looking watches on sale today, it also comes in one of the most mouthwatering colours too, a light pistachio green. We've fallen for this trick before though, when a watchmaker releases a delicious looking watch, but it turns out it's big enough for King Kong's bigger brother, Grand Kong. And the Premier B01 does disappoint at 42mm across, but the B09 is just 40mm, that makes it the right size for humans. I honestly think it's a masterpiece in design, and not just because I like old man watches, but because every detail is beautifully considered. It really shows the power of letting people who are good at their jobs just get on with it, and not interfering at every turn. For a modern watch, there's barely any text on the dial. It doesn't insist on telling you its life story. And look how big the subdials are. And how it doesn't look like it's trying to stare at its own nose. So it's really, truly a colossal shame that this thing is as thick as a paving slab. 13mm isn't the worst a watch has ever been, but for a watch this pretty it's like putting swangers on a 250 GTO. What's especially crazy is that to get the watch to 13mm over the 13.6mm B01, they ditch the self-winding rotor. By comparison, watches with the manually wound version of the Solita SW510 series chronograph can get down to 11.5mm. If there's one watch you can pin the craziness of the whole watch investment um, craze on, it's the Patek Philippe Nautilus. Once considered fragile, ugly and badly proportioned, and by once I mean right now, by me, it became worth many of its flimsy weight in gold when someone somewhere decided it was the best thing since John Clock and Albert Radio met each other on a rowdy Saturday night out. It's so bad, even Thierry Stern, Patek Philippe's Grand Master, isn't a fan. He's so against the idea of the Nautilus becoming too Patek Philippe what the Royal Oak is to Audemars Piguet, he recently discontinued it in steel and re-released it in white gold so even less people could have one, but they wouldn't make any less money. That's thinking with your shoes on. Thankfully, if you would like a Patek Philippe and don't like what Patek Philippe makes, there's another sports watch in the collection that makes the Nautilus look like a cheap bottle opener. Launched in 1993, the Aquanaut was the revival of the Nautilus, but this time not the literal result of a napkin sketch. Unlike the Nautilus, the Aquanaut is chunky, rugged and better suited to life doing actual human things. Where the 5711 would scratch and dent if you played it a dubstep track, the Aquanaut is, like the Royal Oak, actually built to be well worn. Don't take my word for it, legendary immortal Paul McCartney has had one for ages, and he can literally own any watch he wants. Like the dude can literally buy Big Ben if he wanted. It's my perfect one watch collection. Well, almost perfect. Because some people can't remember what day it is, the hand grenade dial of the Aquanaut has been fitted with a date display at 3 o'clock. I say fitted, but it fits like I do at an ICP concert. It's like a bay window on a bus. Such an easy thing to fix. Such a shame. Although, having said that, the older 5060A makes the current design look like the work of Norman Foster. With brands like Rolex and Patek Philippe ever pushing up prices to further emphasise their exclusive and unattainable nature, it came as something of a surprise when, in 2018, Vacheron Constantin went in completely the opposite direction. Now before we talk about the watch, I want you to listen to this line from the original 2018 press release, which coincided with the launch at, for reasons that will soon become not clear, Abbey Road Studios. Listen to this. An exclusive performance by English singer-songwriter Benjamin Clementine provided a musical narrative for the launch of the partnership between the Maison and the legendary recording studio, as well as tunefully accompanying the presentation of the first 56. So although the entry-level 56 will cost you less than a Rolex Daytona, it still comes with the full complement of luxury marketing fluff. And that is expensive. It's a mad thing to think of one of the oldest and most well-respected watchmakers in the world doing this. It shouldn't work, making a cheap version of an expensive watch, packed with a budget movement behind the famous Maltese Cross logo, but 
it does. Rather transparently, the movement comes from group movement maker Val Fleurier, but gets the Vacher on touch for its finish. They save some more cost not sending it to the Geneva Seal people, and those savings are passed on to you! When the next cheapest watch is almost double the price, you can see why this presents as unusual. Think about it like this. There's about a £6,000 difference between a moon watch and a moon swatch, but there's about a £10,000 difference between the 56 and the Patroni above it. How do they get away with it? I'm not really sure. A lot of people thought they wouldn't. But they did, and now it means more people than ever can nurse a small hope of actually owning a watch from one of the big three. So what is there to gripe about? Some might say the movement, but without that it wouldn't be possible. Some might say the date window, but colour matched it's inoffensive and useful for the aforementioned day forgetters. Maybe it's the name, which borrows from a similar 1956 model in the same way Tudor badges its black bays. Nah, none of that. It's the crown. Everything else about the watch is just so elegant and beautifully balanced, and yet the crown looks like it was swapped out at Timpson's. The inward taper, the many narrow ridges, it's just all wrong, and it bruises me greatly. Having said that, I still wouldn't say no. What's the watch that you've got the hots for? Almost. Tell me about your near-perfect obsessions down in the comments below. Please like and subscribe, and all that blah as well. Thanks, and see you next time. Still here? Watch this video next.